Salatu was salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa man ittaba'a sunnatih ila yawm al-deen wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli a few announcements <coughs> excuse me a few announcements before we start um, brother Omar Rashid who is standing right there will be undertaking babysitting for the kids as well as giving them ice cream so if you have children, mashallah, he does an amazing job and he'll be doing that this evening. Also, just um, a bit of trivia. If you're praying and your child is in front of you, it is completely fine to grab them and pick them up in salah. There's nothing wrong with that. We take care of our children. Ash the Prophet sallallahu an authentic hadith used to hasten through the prayer if there was a child crying. So if you see a child in front of you is crying, don't hesitate to go out and grab the child. Um, without further ado, tonight we are going to be talking about Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. That was the topic of the khutbah, as the khatib mentioned, but he gave a very beautiful khutbah, um, sort of instead. Alhamdulillah, before getting into some of the more fine things about Umar radiallahu anhu, we have to know who he was as a person. Why do when we talk about Umar, or when certain people say Umar, they have certain feelings, whereas other people, they may not understand it on the same level. Umar ibn Khattab was a big man. He was very tall, so much so that when people saw him and amongst other people, it looked as if he was riding on a horse or as if he was riding on an animal. He was a very tall person. And he wasn't just tall and thin, he was husky. He had a lot of meat on him, but as the narrations say, he was, it was all muscle. So he wasn't just tall, he was strong as well. And in Jahiliyyah, before Islam, he was known to be a wrestler and to be very, very successful in that. Not only that, he was someone before Islam who just the hearing of his name sent fear in people's hearts. So not only was he a big person, he was also a person who demanded respect. Some narrations say that when he spoke, everyone listened. You weren't saying anything when Umar was speaking. When he walked, when he came down a road, people would flee away from him. If he hit someone, whether it was in war defending them, people bled. There wasn't some small smacking. When he hit, he hit. And he was known to strike fear in the hearts of his enemies. And even those people who were close to him, they had some care about how they dealt and how they acted around Umar. So Umar was no one to be played with. This is before Islam. We're talking about Umar before he accepted Islam. And it was even said that when Umar, one time he was walking down the street and a woman, she was pregnant. She turned around and saw Umar, and because of it, she had a miscarriage. And this was the time when he was Amir al Mu'minin. The companions were trying to figure did now Umar have to play blood money because he did this? Ali took the ruling that his money goes to Bayt al Ma'. This is how serious and how much respect that Umar al Khattab demanded. He put fear in people's hearts by just being, just walking. Also, it is said that he never in his life ever feared anything. Nothing ever shook him. No enemy, no person, nothing. So not only was he a big person and demanded respect, on top of that he was incredibly courageous and fearless. Arabs during pre-Islamic times and times of Jahiliyyah, they drink alcohol. And they didn't just drink, they drink. But Umar was known to be the heaviest drinker out of everyone. And this was something that they held pride in. But Umar, he said he was, no one could outdrink him. On top of that, he himself participated in a practice called Wa'dul Banat, which was burying their daughters alive. And this wasn't something that all the tribes of Jahiliyyah did. But Umar, 
he himself, he said that one day he was amongst the companions and they saw him and he was laughing in one second and the next second he was crying. So they asked him, why? What's going on? Why did you do this? Why, why one second you're laughing, the next second you're crying? So Umar, he replied, I was laughing because before Islam, I made an idol out of dates. But then I ended up getting hungry and I ate the idol. So this made him laugh. And I was crying because before Islam, I had a young daughter. And this daughter started to grow up and it came to the time where customary practices came and I was to bury her alive. And they did this because they didn't like having sons, or they didn't like having daughters. They thought the daughters brought bad luck and it, for whatever reasons. So Umar, he took his daughter and he went out and dug a grave for her. And his young daughter was at, she wasn't just a baby. She had grown up to the point where when she saw some dirt on his beard, she brushed it out of his beard for her. But then he proceeded with that and buried her alive following the customs. So Umar was a big person who struck fear in everyone's heart, who was fearless, was very, very strong in practicing the customs of his time, whether it be drinking, whether it be burying children alive, but also with regards to the customs that they had. In the story of Umar and how he accepted Islam, he was walking down the road one day on his way to Dar al-Arqam. Dar al-Arqam literally means the house of Arqam. And this was the place that the companions and the Prophet Sallallahu used to come together to read Quran and study. And mind you, this is in the context of pre-Islamic Mecca, where people, they were hiding at nighttime just to practice their Islam, out of fear of persecution. And Umar, when comparing the, the oppression that he himself caused to the Muslims, some narrations say it was equal to that of Quraysh in totality. So when he was upset, he was upset. So he's walking down the road at nighttime with a very serious look on his face. And one of the companions, Naeem, excuse me, I forget his family name, but he saw Umar and he could tell that something was up. So he asked Umar, what's going on? Where are you going? Jazakallah khair. Allah inna wa I'd refuse to let me get the tea. He said, I'm bringing you tea. Zalla khair. So Naeem ibn Abdullah was on his way, uh, was saw Umar walking in this very serious way. And he asked Umar, where are you going? What's going on? And Umar, he responded, I'm going to that saber. I'm going to that sword that has caused and separated Quraysh who has caused these problems in my family, in my tribe. He said, he's hampered our dreams. All the dreams we had as a tribe of what we were going to accomplish, where we were going to be, this man has ruined that. He's shamed our religion and he's cursed our idols. I'm going to kill him. Now this is what Naeem ibn Abdullah hears out of Umar al-Khattab, this person we just mentioned was so severe in who he was. But then Umar didn't stop there. He says, perhaps you too have been afflicted by what they've been afflicted. And I swear on Allah wal Uzza, I swear on the two biggest idols that we have. If this is true, I'm going to start with you. So not only did he say he's on a mission to go commit murder, to murder the, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu And he's on his way to do that. He told this companion, let me find out you are Muslim too. So the companion immediately understood what was going on. He understood the situation he was in and reassessed things. And he deflected. He said, why are you going to Dar al-Arqam don't you know that your own sister and her husband have accepted Islam? In other words, why are you paying attention talking about Prophet Muhammad, someone else's house, Dar al-Arqam, Arqam's house? Why are you worried about that when your own house have accepted Islam? So Umar, being a man of honor, a man of family and prestige, 
he now is redirected and goes to the house of his sister. When he gets there, another companion was teaching them Quran, Khabab, and Khabab went and hid somewhere. And it was just Umar's sister who was reading Quran. There are different narrations to what happens exactly, but just because Umar, when he came and the way that he knocked on the door, if we could imagine when the police comes and knocks on the door, as we see in 48 hours or whatever else it is, Umar came with seriousness. And when he knocked the door, it shook the house. And Umar now tells them to let him in. And his sister, in this commotion, gets startled. And she becomes struck by something and she starts bleeding. So Umar, he's like, what's going on? What was that that I just heard you reading? And she says, don't worry, it was nothing. So Umar says, no, what was it that you were reading? And she tells him, you can't read this until you go take a shower. So he goes, he, he cleans himself, he comes back, and he reads the very verses that Imam Muhammad Nabil just recited for us in Surah Taha, the very first verses. And it struck a chord in Umar's heart, radiallahu It changed him. And it actually changed the course of history forever. Umar now is back on a pledge to the house of Dar Arqam, but for very different reasons. And before this, the Prophet ﷺ had made dua, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide either Abu Jahl or Umar al-Khattab. So now Umar is going to the house Dar Arqam on this new mission. And when he gets there, the companions, they automatically stand up because they know who Umar is. They know what type of person it is when he comes to the door. That's as if when someone were to come into our masjid right now, and they've got a name for whatever it may be that they do. We're automatically going to stand up in defense for what about the Prophet ﷺ? So they stand up and the Prophet ﷺ calms them down. And long story short, Umar ibn Khattab accepts Islam. But look at the sincerity that Umar had. He wasn't just a fearless warrior, a mindless beast. When he listened to the Qur'an, he truly listened to the Qur'an. When he cared about defending his family, when he went to his sister, when he was defending his tribe, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me, when he was defending his tribe, he was doing it passionately. And when something better came, when he heard the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, it changed everything immediately. So he tells the Prophet Sallallahu O Messenger of Allah, are we not upon the truth? Isn't it that now what we believe, isn't it true? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he says, I swear by the one who's, who owns and controls my soul that what we are upon is the truth, if you're dead or you're alive. Meaning it doesn't matter what you are in your situation, we're on the truth, whether we can be out with it or not. So Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he says in a very poetic way in Arabic, swearing multiple times that by the one who sent you with the truth, you're going to go out. La takhrujanna is what it is in Arabic. So it's multiple swears. I swear by the one who, can, who sent you with the truth. The lamb in the beginning is also emphasis and the noon at the end at the, of the word is an emphasis as well. So he's saying, you're going to go out. There's no more hiding of this Islam stuff that you have, O Messenger of Allah. You're going to go out and preach the truth. And I'm going with you. This was Umar ibn Khattab. Just from hearing the Quran, he was forever changed. He went from going to kill the Prophet ﷺ out of hate for Islam to hearing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and forever being changed and wanting to now be a defender of the truth. So this was Umar. And this was the Quranic transformation that he had. This was how the Quran affected him in his life. Sheikh Yasser, he mentioned in the Aqidah Intensive a few weeks ago that Umar, he was so in tune with the Quran that sometimes what he would have intuition about 
Allah would then sit down with the Quran. And the metaphor that Sheikh Yasser, he mentioned, was how when we have cell phones and it's on the radio, and before the phone call comes in, we hear that fuzz, bzzz, you know there's a call coming in even though no call has come in yet. That's how Umar was. Umar knew that it was time for alcohol to be prohibited. And he just had this feeling, he made dua very shortly after that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited alcohol. There were times in wars, there were many different occasions where this happened. And there's so much so that people have written books of waqafat Umar, the, the times that Umar has stopped and he was writing with the Quran. So now we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to be like Umar ibn Khattab? This was just in his own personal life and how he was, but it also affected him both inwardly and outwardly, how he dealt with other people as well. Umar went from being a very proud and strong and boastful person to a person who stood for justice and a person who stood for the truth. How many times do we have narrations where someone would come to the Prophet Sallallahu and Umar would say, Da'ani adrub arnaqa. Let me just hit his neck because they disrespected the Prophet Sallallahu Let me, because he disrespected you, let me get rid of him right now. He won't ever do that again. Umar ibn Khattab when he became the Khalifa, as the Khatib mentioned today in the khutbah, he would walk in the streets of Medina looking for people who were in need. And the story that the Imam he mentioned today was that he came across a woman, an elderly woman, who didn't know who Umar was. So she asked him, he asked her, excuse me, what is it, what's going on? And she cursed Umar. Umar, he, he's taking all this money, he's living like this, he's living like that, I don't have anything to eat. So as the Imam he mentioned earlier, <clears throat> Umar didn't leave her house until she had something to eat. He kindled the fire. He cooked for him himself. This is Amir al-Mu'mineen. Mind you, Amir al-Mu'mineen in the time of Umar, this is when the most expansion of our ummah ever happened. This is where Islam spread the furthest. The Imam, he mentioned today that when people, when there was the, the year, the time that there was a drought and they needed food, he called to Sham, to Syria, and he called to Egypt, telling them to send food. So this is the entire Arabian Peninsula, all of Syria, Jordan, Palestine, probably most of Iran, Egypt, some parts of Northern Africa. All of this was under Umar's rule. Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the Muslims. And he's up late at night cooking for a woman, making sure that she had food. There wasn't people that he delegated to walk in the streets of Medina. He himself went looking for people. This is the man who, who before people were so scared that a woman had a miscarriage just by seeing him. There was another story of a governor whose son, not the governor, his son, hit his servant. And the servant complained to Umar ibn Khattab. So Umar sent a letter calling for the governor and his son. So they go to now Umar al Khattab, trying to figure out what's going on. And the servant now says, this man hit me. So Umar commands the servant, hit the boy. After he finished hit the boy, he said, now hit his father, the governor. So the governor, why am I getting hit now? What's going on? He said, because you're the governor and you're supposed to be in charge of what your son does. I don't want anyone saying, that the people that I put in charge are letting this happen under their rule. Another governor came from Sham and he found Umar playing with children. So he goes, you play with your kids? What's going on, man? You're Amir al mumini why are you playing with your children? And Umar, he said, you don't play with your kids? He said, no. He says, oh, so what do you do? He said, when I come in, Fear is stricken in their hearts and he goes on about proudly how he's such a manly man and this is what he does. What did Umar do? He stripped him of his position. What's going on? Why are you stripping me of my position? The man asked. He says, because if you can't have mercy with children, then how are you going to have mercy with the people that you're in control of? This was Umar. Radiallahu anhu. This was the humility 
This was the mercy and the transformation that the Quran had in being in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ had on Umar al-Khattab. He was a man that was Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was the ruler of all the Muslims, but his door was never closed. When people came looking for him, they'd find him under a tree covered in dust. So now the question is, how is our relationship with the Quran? When we hear, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe. When we hear, Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind, how do we feel? When we hear a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, do we just think, oh, that's sunnah, we don't have to do it. You know, it's just sunnah, you know, it's not obligatory. Or is it something that we rush to do? Mind you, Ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, was known to be the strongest adherent to the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. So much so that when he would travel, people would see him walking in the footsteps that the Prophet ﷺ walked in. The Prophet walked in places, he walked in those footsteps. He would take rest under a tree for no reason. Why are you stopping? Are you tired? He would say, no, but I saw the Prophet ﷺ stop under this tree, so I'm going to stop under it too. Umar had this effect on his family. What about us on our family? How are we having when we are dealing with our children? How are it when we're dealing with our family, with our wives, with our brothers and sisters, with our communities? So Ramadan is two months or less away. And I'm speaking to myself first and foremost. I need to be preparing more than anyone else. But Ramadan is two months away. What are we doing? How are we gonna have this Umar type of transformation? if we aren't starting now. And we have to check ourselves when we're listening to the Qur'an, when we're reading the Qur'an. Are we just doing a surface read like we do textbooks for school, just flipping through pages? Are we doing a deep reading to get bits and pieces here and there, we're skimming through it? Are we doing a synoptic reading where we're reading it in depth, pausing on different ayat? Because this is how Umar was. When he would read ayat, he would stop, reflect on how it was, and then try to implement it in his life. This is how we have to be with the Qur'an. So with that, أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ونساء المسلمين وأستغفره وأتوب إليه.